Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very sorry that I had to drive you away from your home on a Friday afternoon. Over the last 10 days, I have visited Thailand and Bangladesh. I have spoken to a range of people from Myanmar, as well as authorities, UN agencies, international experts, and members of the international community. I extend my thanks to the governments of Thailand and Bangladesh, the UN resident coordinator of uh, Thailand, Bangladesh, and Myanmar and their staff, and the senior coordinator of the international of the intersectorial coordination group in Cox's Bazaar and his team. I also thank Prime Minister Sheikh Hazina of Bangladesh for allowing me to visit Bashanchar and generously providing the logistics for me to travel there with my team. The observations I give here, which are based on the information gathered in the last, last 10 days, will be elaborated upon in my next Human Rights Council report. Though the government of Myanmar is maintaining its position not to allow me access to the country, I again emphasize my willingness not to work with, with it in the spirit of cooperation. The government says that I am biased, However, I stated from the, from the outset of my mandate that I will execute my mandate objectively and independently and not shy away from calling a spade a spade. The government took issue with my information statement in 2017 July. These statements are short and can only present what was observed during the mission visit. It is the Human Rights Council report that will elaborate on my full analysis of positive and negative developments in Myanmar. I have spoken several times now about how the human rights situation in Myanmar continues to deteriorate and how many parts of the repressive architecture that, is that existed under successive military governments remain. It saddens me greatly today to tell you that I believe that instead of bringing about the democratic reforms that were promised, the civilian government is consolidating what military governments worked towards for many years. Democratic space, including the freedoms of speech and association, is ever fragile. Communities across the country remain divided among religious and ethnic lines, and members of minorities face marginalization and discrimination. Ethnic nationalities around the country continue to be subject to domination by the central government and the military, despite the official stance that they are working towards peace. Justice and accountability is urgently needed in Myanmar, and we be must begin just transitional justice in initiatives throughout the country. There are lessons to be learned from the Asian region and countries further afield that have pursued innovative and dynamic just judicial and non-judicial measures to ensure justice for human rights violations. I believe that Myanmar would be greatly assisted by exploring the transitional justice pillars of truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-recurrence. It is clear to me that under the 2008 Constitution, Myanmar cannot be called a democracy. And until the Constitution is re reformed, the transition to justice will not be achieved. I am greatly concerned that the enduring repressive environment in, is discouraging people from speaking out freely about human rights violations and injustices. Disagreements, criticism, and debate are healthy and necessary in any functioning democracy. Journalists and human rights defenders continue to be targeted for exercising their right up to freedom of expression. Zawjat, Napu, and Longzhang, the Kachin peace activists and Wolo Chosui, the two writers journalists, languish in jail for their work. Journalist Sui Wen has been subjected to judicial harassment for his criticism of the Buddhist extremist group on Babatha. 
I must also draw attention to the situation of Nampu, one of the jailed Kachendu activists, who has serious health conditions and is not receiving appropriate medical treatment while in jail. I call on the authorities to end this mistreatment and immediately release all those unjustly imprisoned. During 2018, there was recurrence of fighting in Cayenne State, despite the current National Liberation Army being a signatory to the nationwide ceasefire agreement. This trend has continued into this year, with several clashes already taking place in Mutra district in close proximity to civilians who see these troops moving through their villages and forests and hear gunfire nearby. I have been told that the military is constructing new bases in Kaya State, and I'm concerned that fighting may soon break out there too. There are around 162,000 IDPs in the southeast states and regions, living in camps or scattered throughout rural communities. They need humanitarian assistance, as they have little access to adequate food, health care, and education, and few choices for earning a living. The insecurity in Southeast Myanmar undermines their prospects for sustainable return, as it is also done for those living in the Thai border refugee camps. I welcome the unilateral ceasefire in Kachun and Shan, announced by the Tatmadaw in December as well as the statements issued by the Arakan Army, Ta'ang Liberation Army, and Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, that they're willing to stop fighting and enter formal negotiations. However, I am seriously concerned about the fighting between ethnic armed organizations in Shan. This largely takes place in civilian areas and has contributed to further instability and insecurity for villagers and temporarily displaced 6,000 people between October and December. I'm concerned that this fighting will lead to divisions between communities in Chan and further hamper efforts at achieving peace. I heard from many of worried members of civil society who are concerned that the situation of the people in IDP camps in Kachin, Shan, and Rakhine. Under the government's plans to close these camps, the government would relocate people to remote areas far from their places of origin and remove from economic opportunities and humanitarian support. While the government's consultation with the UN on camp closure is welcome, it has failed to consult the IDPs and national and international organizations that are working with the displaced populations. Returns to the IDPs, places of origin are needed, but such plans must be in accord with the international standards of safety, voluntariness, dignity, and sustainability. Furthermore, I am deeply concerned refugees and those who are inter internally displaced have been made particularly vulnerable to losing their rights to their homelands by the recent amendments to the 2012 Bacon Fallow and Virgin Lands Management Law. This law will also permit the government to appropriate land from people who live there on the basis of customary practices. This is commonplace in ethnic areas, including Rakhine, Kachin, Shan, and Kayin State, where communities have depended on this land for their livelihoods, traditions, and cultures for generations. Vast areas of land have already been seized from people to make way for hydropower dams, and I have spoken with many who fear losing their lands and livelihoods should plan dams such as Midzone, Upper Canton, Upper Yawa, and Haji go ahead. There is no transparency surrounding these plans, and the government has failed to consult those affected, causing further concern and uncertainty for millions. As with hydropower projects, the extraction of natural resources, including, gem, uh, including gems and timber, continue to be inextricably linked to the cycle of armed conflict and human rights violations in Myanmar. It has been reported to me that in the vast jade mining regions of Kachin State, displacement, the sale of drugs, environmental destruction, and widespread corruption at the hands of the military, malicious ethnic armed organizations, and private actors is rife. I have heard reports of similar abuse at other sites, such as gold mines in Kanai. With the extraction of natural resources and distribution of the revenue so fundamental to the peace process, 
and transition to federal democracy, this is a critical time for the government to demonstrate a genuine commitment to addressing these serious social and environmental impacts and establishing a legal framework that demands transparency and accountability. In Rakhine, I am disturbed by recent clashes between the Tatmadaw and the Arakan army, which reportedly resulted in the deaths of members of security forces and civilians, which has displaced some 6,000 civilians. The order by the state government to refuse access to humanitarian organizations, with the exception of ICRC and WRP, is entirely unacceptable and a violation of Myanmar's international humanitarian law obligation to allow humanitarian aid. Government rhetoric characterizing the Rakhine community as sympathizers, collaborators, and associates of the AA threatens only to increase tensions in the region and divisions between ethnic communities. Similarly, comments by the government linking, linking AA and A and ARSA are deeply irresponsible and point to the disturbing prospect of further attacks on the range of population that remain in Rakhine State. From the discussions I had with the Rohingya this week in Bangladesh, it is evident that Myanmar is not working to create conditions for return for the Rohingya, but is engaging in a sustained campaign of violence, intimidation, and harassment. I spoke to one woman who arrived in Cox's Bazaar matters of days after her father was stabbed to death by Myanmar security forces. A man I spoke to told me that he and his entire family fled recently after his mother and daughter were abducted and raped. During my visit, I received videos of houses burning in Mongdo Township, the second such incident to occur in Mongdo in 2019 alone. According to information gathered by my team, the houses were burned by Myanmar security forces working in concert with Rakhine Buddhists, extremists. Excuse me. The campaign of violence against the Rohingya continues, with the security forces slowly bleeding the remaining Rohingya con population and continuing to force them to flee to Bangladesh. I visited the so-called Zero Line, the area along the border where more than 4,000 Rohingya refugees live within walking distance of the houses a few miles away. A visit to this area is a lesson in Myanmar recalcitrance and highlights that authorities there are not sincere in their discussions of repatriation. Security forces on the Myanmar side of the border are engaging in an intimidation campaign in the apparent hope of driving this group out of the zero line and into Bangladesh territory. This includes shooting into the air to scare the community and blaring broadcasts which state that they are not Myanmar citizens and that they should leave Myanmar territory. It is clear that Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh cannot return to Myanmar in the near future. Now that the election in Bangladesh has concluded, I encourage the government to begin to engage in longer term planning and prepare the local population for this reality. A failure to do so will not only have negative consequences for the refugee population, but also for Bangladesh, including most significantly the host community who are already given so much to accommodate the refugees. I do not underestimate the burden that housing so many refugees is for Bangladesh. However, this burden will not be lessened by excluding Rohingya children from formal education. Equally, access to livelihood opportunities must also be ensured. This is not only vital for the physical and mental well-being of the refugees, but it would also provide an outlet through which the refugee population can have some positive impact on the local economy and positive engagement with the host community. Recent developments highlight that the internationalization of the ring Recent developments highlight that the internationalization of the Rohingya issue is a real threat. I am dismayed by Saudi Arabia's recent deportation of 13 Rohingya to Bangladesh, where they have been arrested and charged with forging the passports that they used to travel to Saudi Arabia. 
The fair trial rights of these men should be fully upheld, and authorities here must recall that this group also fled persecution in Myanmar. I am disturbed to see that Rohingya now arriving in Bangladesh from India. Following the deportation of two groups of Rohingya by the Indian authorities to Myanmar, the 1,300 people who are reported to have already arrived in Bangladesh from India state that they fled due to the fears of a and heightened anti-Rohingya rhetoric from the Indian authorities. I have on many occasions already commended Bangladesh for the, and welcome, for the welcome it has extended to the Rohingya of Myanmar. I repeat this again and at the same time call for all international re response to what is fast becoming a regional pro a problem with global consequences. India and Saudi Arabia must ensure that Rohingya within their, ter within their borders are protect protected and their status as refugees unable to return to Myanmar is recognized. This brings me to Bhutan Chor. As many of you already know, yesterday my team and I undertook a visit to the island in the Bay of Bengal where Bangladesh plans to relocate a large number of the refugees from Cox's Bazar. I am told that there are 450 chars in Bangladesh, most of which are inhabitable. At the outset, I must express my thanks and appreciation to the government of Bangladesh for accepting my request to visit the island. I traveled by helicopter and had an aerial view of the development, the island and its surrounds. It was clear to me that the government has put tremendous effort and resources into the construction of the buildings and embarkment. I'm not a technical expert on construction or housing, so I will not make comments, any comments about the buildings or the physical infrastructure. However, I call on the government of Bangladesh to share feasibility studies it has undertaken and to allow the UN to carry out a full technical and humanitarian assessment, including a security assessment, before making any further plans for the housing of people on the island. To date, there have been no discussions with the humanitarian community on the protection framework for the island. It goes without saying that no relocation should even be contemplated until the protection framework for any refugees who do relocate is agreed upon. The government has told me that any refugees who choose to live on Bachanchara would essentially have basic uh, access to the same basic rights as those who live in Cox's Bazaar. Children will have will be able to have primary level education. There will be health facilities, livelihood opportunities, including fishing and farming, and freedom of movement on the island. I was told that refugees would be allowed to visit family and friends in Cox's Bazaar camps, but they would not be able to travel to other parts of Bangladesh. Similarly to my concerns about the situation in Cox's Bazaar camps, I am anxious about whether these conditions are adequate adequate to fulfill the needs and rights of Rohingya refugees, particularly in the medium and longer term. The island's isolation does particularly trouble, especially in the event of cyclone or other natural disasters. If any plans are made about refugee re relocation to Bachanchar in the future, refugees must be fully engaged and participate in the process, including through meaningful consultation, which should involve Go and see visits for refugees so they can determine for themselves whether they wish to move. Without individual fully informed consent, the plans cannot move forward. It is imperative that any measures to relocate the refugees enhance their enjoyment of rights and do not create a new crisis. In this regard, I urge caution and patience by the Bangladesh government and full cooperation with the UN and the international community. There should be no rush to relocate refugees, such as before the monsoon season, which is one of the possibilities that has been outlined to me. The causes of the current Rohingya situation lie in Myanmar, and it is to Myanmar that we must look for this solution. 
Its campaign of violence against ethnic minorities, including the Rohingya, the Cayenne, the Kachin, and the Shan, must end. Real steps must be taken to implement the recommendations of the UN and the Kofi Annan Commission, including by ensuring that the citizenship of the Rohingya is realized. There must be accountability for the campaign of ethnic cleansing and possible genocide against the Rohingya, as well as the war crimes and crimes against humanity perpetrated against ethnic minorities around the country. It is clear that the independent commission of inquiry established by the government of Myanmar will not achieve these ends. While it has called, issued a call for submission of uh, evidence, it may no offer of protection to anyone willing to provide testimony to them and must draw your attention to the notice that issued the call, which in the Myanmar language version required people to list their citizenship scrutiny card number, while in the English version, it did not include that. While the Commission issued information about its mandate and methodology, it has failed to make clear what its objectives are and whether it has the technical capacity to carry them out. While its name states that it is independent, I share the concerns voiced by a range of stakeholders about its members, their close relations to the Myanmar authorities, and their total acceptance of the government narrative of violence in Rakhine State. The independent mechanism that I recommend it be established last year has been formally established and funded, and recruitment has started. Justice for victims is its aim. It will seek to achieve this through the collection of evidence of crimes committed and the creation of case files against alleged perpetrators. These cases will be ready for, for prosecution in a credible international or national court. Part of the concept that I presented to the international community last year was support for victims. This has not been fully brought out yet, and I urge the international community to do so. The people of Myanmar have suffered countless violations in which they are entitled to redress. Criminal justice is not enough. There must also be truth, reparation, and guarantees of non-recurrence. Transitional justice is integral to Myanmar addressing what happened in the past in order to move forward to a peaceful, democratic, prosperous future. During my mission, a number of people raised concerns about the level of support they, the organizations, or the communities they work with are receiving from donors. I implore you to continue to support the people, both in and out of the country, who need it with humanitarian assistance, civil society and human rights defenders who depend on you to fund their activities, and the government as well as engaging with ethnic governance structures so that Myanmar can move towards the federal democracy sought. I address these comments to the people of Myanmar to whom I offer my friendship and support. The government of Myanmar to whom I reiterate previous offers of support and assistance and to the international community who I ask to stand with me, united in the cause of human rights for all the people of Myanmar. Thank you. Please uh, introduce yourself, then you ask question. In the first round will be, we'd like to take three questions, then we'll go for second round. Thank you and thank you, Excellency, for your very nice speech. I am Rashid Mehdi from Daily Shamokal, it is a Bangla Daily. Uh, you have mentioned that Rohingya crisis is not a global issue. You and the Western communities also mentioned the Rohingya crisis as a global and international issue, but Russia and China mentioned it is a bilateral issue. That means Russia and China, on behalf of that, they supported the genocide, violence, and the ethnic cleansing of Myanmar. And they encouraged the help to Myanmar to uh, bypass the international community's call also. So, while the Russia and the China is the member of UN Security Council, so is any chance to take any uh, successful manners to solve the problem from the UN is possible? Why that Russia and China is the member of Security Council? Thank you. This is 
Kamran Jaman. I work for Aladulu Agency, Turkish Government News Agency. Uh, uh, you have already mentioned that in the what we is, uh, have seen in the past few days that uh, uh, genocide is proved, ethnic cleansing proved, human rights violation proved according to UN fact finding missions and other watchdogs in court. Uh, and your uh, initiative, like United Nations and the other uh, powerful organizations, that are telling, uh, they're expressing concern, uh, they're urging Myanmar to behave politely or uh, pro uh, properly. But do you think this type of appeal or uh, is enough uh, for Myanmar who are not responding uh, to any appeal by the international community? So what should you do? Uh, uh, or uh, whether this initiative, this mere concern is enough uh, uh, to, to tackle Myanmar. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Professor Lee. Uh, it's here uh, in the back. Oh, the yellow shirt. Can you see me? Oh, yes. Here. Yes, All right, thank you. Uh, uh, finally. Uh, so, you know, you are saying that uh, that Bangladesh should do this, Bangladesh should do this, Bangladesh should do this, and many, not only you, I mean, the entire UN system and international community are say, have been saying this since the problem uh, started. But 17 months down the line, the United Nations has simply failed to get access to the affected area. Do, do you not think that the international community, especially the United Nations and more especially your office, is asking for too much from Bangladesh, which is already burdened with millions of problems of its own? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for these questions, very uh, good questions, uh, thought-provoking questions too. Uh, Russia and uh, China and the Security Council, what can we do? And I've made my uh, views very clear on media, etc., uh, numerous number of times, uh, so I will not go uh, into the details of what my feelings are about uh, the inefficiency of how the security system functions. Um, and I will join this with Andalou's uh, question about uh, is mere concern enough? Uh, of course it's not enough. Uh, I don't see how the, U the UN system, the United Nations, well, not UN system, the United Nations, uh, in particular Security Council, will let this this horrible atrocities in, committed in front of their eyes go by. We've said, how, how many times have we heard? Never again. We're witnessing again one more time. Um, <coughs> this is why I have laid out some proposals of what can be done. Uh, if we wait for Security Council uh, with the power, the veto power of uh, Russia and uh, uh, China, uh, it may never happen. There's been efforts within the Security Council to change that rule of, you know, not giving the permanent uh, votes, the permanent permanency of the votes, but that has not um, developed in the way that we had expected or hoped it to develop. So. With that said, it is not just the U, uh, Security Council that can refer a, a case to the uh, International Human Rights Court. It can be the member states itself. And I, uh, several member states got together to refer Venezuela to the Security Council in the last uh, five, six months. So this is a possibility that um, the member states themselves can go ahead to refer uh, Myanmar to the Security Council. There's also a possibility of invoking or applying uh, universal jurisdiction. And some courts uh, in the national, domestic national courts of uh, different member states 
Uh, you may recall that Spain has done that in the case of Pinochet. And there have been other cases throughout uh, Europe that have done that. So that's another possibility. Um, another uh, possibility is now we have to maybe think about uh, establishing an ad hoc criminal court for Myanmar. Okay, so these are all the different options. Now, I think, and our colleague in the back said 17 months. 17 months is 17 months too late for any uh, intervention or any response to a situation. Uh, the UN has failed to access to the affected areas. Yes, the UN as a whole has failed to give access to the affected area. Uh, but only ICRC and uh, WFP have now access to the northern Rakhine states. Uh, is the, the international community or the UN asking too much from Bangladesh? It's a, it's a perceptive perception issue, I think. Bangladesh has done more than any country can do, uh, has ever done in history to house a large number of people in such who, who came to over the borders in such short speak amount of time and. So uh, we all recognize that. We are trying to put more pressure on the international donors to really fulfill their pledges in supporting uh, Bangladesh. However, uh, having done all this, uh, and we are putting some recommendations for Bangladesh to further the situation, to better the situation. Otherwise, it will, it can have, it has the potential of having um, great implications within uh, Bangladesh and other regional areas. Miss uh, Lee, my name is Yabek. Uh, my name is uh, Rahim Dizas. I represent uh, Bangla Daily Potomalo. I have a, uh, I just make it uh, two part of my question. One is related to just the last one in the first set regarding the put more pressure on Bangladesh. Uh, in your opening statement that so far Myanmar has not done anything that create the conducive environment for a tangible and sustainable as well as a very dignified repatriation in uh, Rakhine. At the same time you mentioned that uh, what Bangladesh should do and what Bangladesh should not do. You mentioned that uh, about the freedom of access of the Rohingya, uh, if I'm not wrong, beyond the Cox's Bazar area. And uh, you also mentioned not to be in a hurry in regards to relocation to the fashion shop. So considering this aspect, from our part, we sometimes do feel that you dictated more on Bangladesh in regards to dealing the issues of Rohingya, despite you uh, uh, appreciated the role of Bangladesh and sometimes we do feel that this uh, created some extra burden or pressure though we did a lot of job uh, because of our uh, resource constraint and other things and in the second part of your of my question that is precise uh, regarding your visit to Bashar job just uh, yesterday you see that I, if I'm not wrong that when you uh, roam around the Bashar job from the chopper you see a very different aspect. And when you landed there and stayed there, uh, if I'm not wrong, more than three hours, you get a sort of different impression. But uh, in your opening statement, you confine yourself on the more technical aspect, rather than what your uh, perspective before visiting Bhashan Chor and visiting uh, Bhashan Chor afterwards. So can you give us some more lights, what you saw yesterday on your own eyes, whether the housing, the bazaar, and all the uh, all the efforts that Bangladesh put in last almost one year. Thank you. Good, up, good evening, Professor. Uh, this is Hasi from Channel 24. As we see that uh, we haven't seen any uh, anything from Myanmar to take these people back to their homeland and give their citizenship back. So, is this possible rather than we put them in Fashal Chor in the ASEAN countries, in maybe in small amount, 15,000 or like one, one lakh? Is it possible? Can you even do this? Because 
uh, Myanmar is not giving us a, I don't know, money. It's like they don't care UN. They don't care Bangladesh. They don't care humanity. They care about themselves. Good evening, Your Excellency. Christine Burkais, working with the Bangladesh Television. Uh, that's Bangladesh Vision. Uh, you mentioned in your opening speech that uh, in their future it is uh, quite impossible to return uh, our repatriation. So uh, Bangladesh is uh, talking about uh, uh, establishing a safe zone in Rakhine State, and they are uh, Bangladesh uh, already proposed to the United Nations about their safe zone. So are you working on that uh, uh, proposal? Thank you. Okay, thank you for these uh, questions. I think um, mm, uh, the gentleman on this side, I'm not sure. Uh, yes. Uh, boy, you have inside sources of how many hours I spent in uh, Cox's Bazaar. Or was it somebody else? Oh, that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know where you got your, where you have your inside sources of how many hours I spent, but. Huh? We don't, we don't do it. This was our source. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Uh, I think that uh, some of the recent questions are, are you putting too much pressure on Bangladesh? I'm not putting any pressure on Bangladesh. These are genuine suggestions from a human rights expert that can make to a uh, uh, friendly Bangladesh government. And this is not to put pressure or to criticize Bangladesh government. Uh, and somebody mentioned that, I, I said that uh, they have to have uh, freedom to move beyond Cox's Bazaar. It's not in my statement, if you read my statement carefully. If you, if you go back to my statement, I never said anything about moving beyond. Would you distribute the copies? It, it'll be on the web, on the web, in my, on my um, website. And not to hurry relocation. This is uh, a, a, a genuine advice a recommendation that a human rights expert can give is not to hurry because once you, unless these some of the parameters are all discussed and thought through, uh, there's no reason to really hurry. This. How can you relocate to a third country? Fifteen thousand here, fifty-five thousand there. I know that's not a possibility. I, I don't know if any country will have take okay. I will take 15,000. I will take 10,000. That's not a possible. That's not, realistically, that's not possible. So we are, I'm trying my best, and, and, I'm, and then, uh, with, others are trying their best to put pressure on Myanmar and to put pressure on the international community and the international donors to assist Bangladesh and the host communities that have given up a lot uh, in Cox's Bazaar. Um, now, my, it goes back to my basic feeling that once you relocate people out of uh, Cox's Bazaar, I mean, everybody wants to go back home if it's conducive. Uh, you want to go back. If you're traveling, you want to go back home. I want to go home. You know, I've been on, the mission, on this mission, you know, and I want to go. The, the feeling of wanting to go back home is a human nature. But let's not forget that if there is easy relocation to other parts, what are we saying to Myanmar? You can do all these things, you can drive people out and we'll take them and we'll find solutions for them. There's no accountability for Myanmar too. So the pressure needs to be still facing towards Myanmar and its responsibility. The safe zone to Rakhine, I've made my, I've, I think I've expressed that, my, my view on that. I do not think that it would, would, would be an appropriate thing. Um, uh, making Myanmar safe through various different means is something different rather than putting them in one safe zone area, because we've seen in history what happened in uh, in some safe zones, where a safe zone was created and they were all killed in the safe zone. 
they were all uh, told that this is a safe zone to live, and they gathered into the safe zones, and they were all killed inside the safe zones. And, and here again, unless all of those uh, protection issues and security and safety issues are thought through, um, I cannot say what, whether I think a safe zone is the appropriate thing or we shouldn't move on to safe zone. Okay. So do you have any hope at all? With, with all of this, you please introduce yourself. So I'm from BD News Twitter. Uh, second question. Yeah. Wait a minute. You're asking? Oh, I was. <coughs> uh, you are telling that the third country repetition idea is not a logical or something. So what do you expect that uh, if they cannot go to Myanmar, uh, will they stay in Bangladesh year, uh, year after year? So will have to take them in Bangladesh? No, I hope there is no misunderstanding I, I, that Bangladesh has to uh, that uh, have to house and uh, host uh, these people. But I know there will be uh, talks, there are discussions around uh, third party, third country re repatriation. But as the gentleman in the back said, you know, 10,000, you know, 5,000, in those big numbers, uh, I don't know if that's, uh, that is, uh, but then again, I, I may be wrong, but that's not um, pragmatically feasible at the moment. That's what I'm, I'm saying. Is there any hope? There has to be hope. Oh, if there's no hope. How? Yeah. That's what I'm here. <laughs> this is my time. <laughs> trying to it's put all pressure. The same, you know? Yeah. So, trying to put pressure and uh, and I think you know, the media should uh, also, uh, you are continuously putting pressure. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that in two years or next year, or even next year, the media attention will fade from this, because when there's another crisis, an emergency in a different part of the world, the media attention will flow there. So I urge you to not lose your attention, your, your gaze into the issue of uh, the, the range of light in uh, Rakhine. Last question. Yes. Uh, th thank you, Professor Lee giving me the opportunity. My name is Kamran. I'm a freelance journalist working with the American government's news site, Radio Free Asia, so it's been our news. So my question is, in your statement, you say that uh, you have given warning to Bangladesh authorities not to hurry in the relocation. So my specific question, uh, and you told that to do more technical studies, my specific question is, if I want to do the history, whether you support the relocation some sooner or later first. Second is, given the rate of population, high rate of population of the Rohingyas, and the, the situation I have visited the place several times, the Kutsil Bazaar, Ukiya Technaf, given the high rates of population, what will happen to that place? And it's already unlivable. So if that be the case, what would happen to the Rohingya and to the local communities, and in particular, of that place? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I said earlier that I was not a technical expert, nor a security expert. I'm a human rights expert, and um, I view this from a human, human rights and humanitarian perspective. Uh, I, I cannot say that I, I agree with you when you say I warn the government not to hurry. I provided my my humble suggestions. You know, that, uh, that unless certain parameters are met, I think uh, the, the the urge to hurry the relocation could be slowed down a little bit. You know, the, all the the humanitarian assessment has to be done. 
human rights assessment has to be done. The security assessment has to be done. I know that there's been a technical assessment, uh, but I'm not a technical expert, and I've seen the technical uh, report, but I've, I understand that there's been a further um, a feasibility study by the government, and I think uh, perhaps if that is shared with the UN and uh, uh, other uh, other experts, then maybe we'll have a better understanding of uh, how feasible it is to relocate to Russian Char. I mean, all in all, do you support the relocation? <coughs> I said. Sooner or later. I have said this repeatedly. I do not want to repeat myself. All of these parameters have to be discussed and thought through before any relocation plan uh, is decided. Thank you. Thank you, my dear friends, for, for joining us. We have Modesty and Smets. Modesty. Thank you. 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 Thank